Hi everyone, please turn to 2 Corinthians 2. The title of what I wanted to speak on today was Nine Schemes of Satan. And I felt alleged to share on that and with regard to our fight against sin. And one thing that helped me a lot um, in my fight against sin and temptation was to um, realize that uh, a lot of times when temptation comes up, Satan is trying to do something specifically to see that he's there working against us, fighting us. Um, it helped me to have a more of a zeal in the fight against sin. And so um, just wanted to share on that. And it says in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 11 here, Paul was talking to the Corinthians and he said, we're not ignorant of his schemes. He says at the end of there, he's, he's giving a context there of something that the devil was trying to do in the church with regard to um, stirring up hardness in their hearts towards a, a brother who had repented of a pretty deep sin. But he says, Satan is trying to do something here. And uh, he was using that to challenge them, recognize that this, this is a reason to fight it, uh, what's in your hearts here. And so um, I realized that when I see, when there's moments that come up and I say, Satan's trying to do something here, it helps me in my fight um, against sin. And, um, and so I see that on a daily basis, many temptations come. And I often forget that I have an enemy that's there. It's God's enemy and my enemy too, working. Uh, and his goal is to pull me away from Jesus. And I realized it's you, Satan's goal, he doesn't usually, he can't really usually do it suddenly. So he tries to do it one temptation at a time. And uh, if we don't fight the temptations and take them seriously, then um, I don't think we'll see our life ruined all at once. But slowly over time, it's kind of like adding five pound weights to a runner who's running a marathon. It will really hurt us uh, in the long run. And the Bible says that we should be casting aside every hindrance and the sin which is entangling us um, so we can run after Jesus. And so uh, we should be familiar with his schemes and I think it will help us and so it, ha it has helped me. And so that's why I felt led to share on that today. Uh, and so number one, the first one is that I've, uh, I've seen that Satan hides the hook and presents the bait, which is to say he emphasizes the attractiveness of the sin, what's good about it, what we'll like about it, what's pretty about it, but he hides the consequences of it. He really wants us to forget about those, to ignore them, and uh, it's kind of like, like how a fisherman, he puts the, such a nice smelly bait on a hook, um, and, but they're there's death in there for the fish. <laughs> and the fish doesn't see it, just sees the pretty thing there. And um, when Satan tempted Eve in the garden, that's exactly what he did. He turned Eve's gaze towards, look how beautiful it is. Look what you'll get from it, the knowledge. Uh, and he didn't, he was minimizing the death. He was, the, the death that God said, you'll die if you eat this, but he really tried to get her to forget about that point. Yeah, God said it, but let's not focus on that. <laughs> and so um, to see that the, the Satan wants to blind us to consequences of sin, the eternal damage that will come to our spiritual life, the, the dulling of our spiritual edge in our walk with God, losing a hunger for God, things that we might not think about in the moment of temptation. But um, I remember Brother Zach shared before an illustration with regard to men fighting the temptation to lust after women. And he said, there can be a Christian brother who's on fire for God and he gives in to lust one time. And it's like getting a, a bucket of ice cold water thrown on him. Just in an instant, he can lose all that, um, all that progress, all that zeal. And so to see that we have to flee temptation like that, if we really want to follow God with the whole heart, um, if we're in the temptation, uh, if, if we can't flee from it, if we can't get away from it, then we have to resist. But if we can flee from it, we should flee and, <laughs> and totally get away from it. And um, Paul said to Timothy, who was a young man, flee the temptation to youthful lusts uh, that come up. And, um, and I, sometimes YouTube channel recommendations come up if, uh, when you're on YouTube. And they, um, there was, I remember seeing this one channel there was a sports channel. And uh, they had some good informative videos, but I realized uh, sometimes their thumbnails weren't so appropriate. There, it wasn't, um, probably the world wouldn't say they were bad, but it was not modest, some of the things that were on there. And 
just so you guys know, there's a little menu option with three buttons. If you click it, you could say, don't recommend from this channel anymore. You can use that uh, and, um, and you could say, ignore this or don't recommend this. Um, and so that's a way of fleeing temptation to say, I don't, I'm not even, even if it has valuable sports videos, I don't, I'm not interested in that because they're feeding a little bit of sports with um, a little bit of poison. And so I wouldn't want to drink water with even one drop of poison, like a, even if it's a full glass of water. Uh, and so to see that Satan will minimize the little bit, he'll say, but look, it's good, good sports videos, but um, it, there's death behind it. And so to see that Satan really tries to do that, he's trying to emphasize the, the bait but hide the hook, uh, helps to, in the fight against sin. Number two is justifying our sin. Uh, others are doing it, why can't I? Even other Christians. Um, others have this, why can't I? Or they did this to me, so I'm right to treat them in this way or say this. Uh, God understands if I do this because uh, I'm in the situation that I'm in, so I have to, I have to sin here. Um, but to see that the, there's, um, there's no reason to justify my sin because the Bible says that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's a way of escape out of every sin. There's, there's never a reason to sin um, if I have God helping me. He'll provide a way that I can get through every situation without sinning. And suppose you're um, in a, a really difficult situation where someone's attacking you verbally and they're just coming up with all these points and reasons and you say, well, you know, if I want to stop this, I got to attack them back too. <laughs> um, they're attacking me. Why can't I attack them? So I, I have, in my mind, I have all these things that I'm ready to say to them. So I stay quiet. It's like they're whipping me. But in, inside, I could, it's, it could be like, well, I have a gun that's ready. I'm loading it with bullets. I'm ready to, to get back at them. <laughs> um, but I, I saw that don't do it. Don't give in to the the desire to revenge or to justify myself, but follow Jesus' way and stay quiet. Look how Jesus um, stayed quiet when people cursed him, when they called him a demon, when they spit on him. He's just quiet, quiet, quiet. And, uh, and I realized in those times when we're really being tempted, we can talk to the Lord and say, Lord, if you want me to respond here, then give me the right word. Otherwise, I'll just try to stay quiet. Please give me the strength. To, that's a good default to stay quiet. Um, and... Uh, and to get, have, ask for the grace to let go of things. Um, why should I, I let go of this? I'm right. Well, they're wrong. <laughs> uh, but it's so, it's so easy to justify ourselves when, um, and to cling, to cling to the fact that I have a reason. But, but Paul was saying to the Corinthians, even though they had a reason, this, this man was committing sin in the church. They had a reason here in 2 Corinthians 2. To, but Paul said, no, Satan is trying to do something here. He's trying to do something, so you have to um, let it go. And so I, I saw that um, justifying my sin is another one of Satan's schemes that he tries to do. Um, number three, not taking the little sins seriously. The Bible says in Proverbs, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I believe the one who fears God is the one who takes the little sins seriously. There's a lot of even unbelievers who don't cheat on their taxes or... Um, cheat on their spouses, or, but who's looking at their thoughts saying, Lord, was my motive right here? Um, I think it takes somebody that loves Jesus to look at all the little things and say, Lord, I want to keep improving, to keep, keep working, um, to pursue a holy life. It says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So I saw God wants me to be holy and pure. That means that when holy means when I see even one spot, that's not okay with me. <laughs> like would a, would a bride who's getting married have a white dress and be okay with even one red spot? And I sh no, she, that she wants a pure dress, like a clean dress. And so I see I should treat my spiritual life like that. And I was thinking recently, how often do I ask God, Lord, was my motive right here? We can, like a lot, a lot of times, make decisions or do things, many decisions throughout the day, but it, Lord, was my thoughts pure when I made this decision? Was my motive right? Going back and judging myself. Um, and to, to see that the one who does that, they're the closest ones to, to God. It says in Psalm 24, 3 and 4, Who can ascend until the hill, of God, the hill of the Lord, and who can stand in his holy place? It's he who has clean hands and a pure heart. 
So it's the one who's judging themselves, who's striving for that purity that can be close to God. Um, I, um, I realize that when I'm playing basketball, um, some of my kids are getting to like basketball a little more and more. I know a lot of kids in the church are. And I realize when we're shooting baskets, like a lot of times I can be carelessly just throwing up the ball. There's the hoop. Let me just try to throw it and make a basket. But I usually don't make it. But if I take a second and I say, I want to aim for the middle of the rim, <laughs> uh, I make a lot more shots like that. Because I'm looking specifically. I want to do my best. I'm aiming um, very specifically. And I saw... Our spiritual life can be like that. A lot of times we can generally wake up and say, yeah, I don't want to sin today. But then just go like, um, go through the, not even thinking about judging myself even once throughout the day. But to say like, I want to aim for the best. I don't even want one sin today. Uh, and to, to treat it like that, the spiritual life like that. Um, and to see that's the way to make progress in the Lord. And um, it's very easy to, to, to look at one little thing and just say, it's just this one time or, you know, how many, how many drug addicts have started like that? It's just one, it's just one time. Or um, spouses ruin families. It's just, it's just one, one look. It's just one time. And thieves started a life of crime with, it's just one, just one time. And uh, I think of Judas who might have looked in the money bag and said, it's just one coin. And look and how it started. Um, but to see that... Uh, to look at the little things and say, Lord, is my heart pure? or my intentions pure? And so, um, and to see that Satan is content to get us to fall in one little area, one little time, because he knows he's, he's okay if he doesn't get us to fall really big today, because he knows the little things will add up eventually if we're not faithful with the little things. Uh, so his scheme is to compromise in the small sins. Uh, beware of that. Number four, discouragement. Discouragement is basically believing Satan's lie of, you've already tried and failed fighting sin, so what's the point? You're already going to heaven anyways. Just give up. Just surrender to a defeated life. God can't help you. You tried. Um, but the, the fact that God gives so many promises in his word that you can't overcome. Sin won't be a master over you, Romans 6.14. And to see that our hope is, it's not only about the victory, but it's what are we saying about God's character? Because can he really help us? We have to declare with our lives that he can help. He can help us be overcomers and he can forgive us too. And uh, I think of Peter and Judas were both great sinners. P um, Jesus said that anybody who denied him would be denied by the Father on the last day. And Peter denied Jesus. Um, and Judas betrayed Jesus. They're both great sins. But the difference between Peter and Judas was Peter trusted that God's love was big enough to cover his sin, that he could keep going. Um, and, and so to not give in to discouragement, um, Satan wants to discourage us to stop fighting sin. That's another one of his schemes. So um, beware of that one. And to, the next one is sort of related is fear and unbelief is another scheme of Satan. Satan wants to drive fear into us. Um, to, which is basically a lack of confidence in God. And it comes out in the sense of, if I, if I don't trust God in a situation, what will inevitably happen is I'll try to control the situation instead. Um, when I don't trust God, the, the outcome is I try to control things, I have, which means I have to sin. I have to sin to make sure that this thing doesn't happen because I'm in fear. That's why fear leads to sin. Um, for example, cheating on a test. Um, I'm not sure God can help me get a good grade, so I got to cheat. I got to do some shortcut. Uh, I have to look at somebody's paper. Or um, for a single person, marrying outside of God's will. God's made me wait for so long already. I'm just not sure. I think I need to take things into my own hands. Um, not sure God's going to give the right spouse soon enough. Um, jumping at somebody outside of God's will. Or with regard to money, being miserly. I don't want to give or spend anything. I'm going to hoard my money because who knows if God will provide later. I've, um, I've been guilty of this many times since. I, I want to know that I'll have enough money so later in my life. But I, I can often forget that God will provide it. And being frugal is good but, um, and cutting back on unnecessary things. But being stingy and miserly, I saw God said, that's sin. Um, where to, uh, so, uh, so as to where I'm controlling other people or not being generous. And so I see that Satan uses that tactic of fear to get us to sin, 
um, in many, many different types of sins, fear, um, he can bring us into sin. So to watch out for that one, trust God. Um, number six, Satan will try to tempt us to sin at the right time when our flesh is the weakest. Uh, in Matthew 4, it says there, Satan waited. It says Jesus was hungry in um, Matthew 4. Jesus had fasted for so many days, uh, 40 days, and then um, it wasn't until the end of that in uh, Matthew 4, it says, verse um, 2, after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And look at what happened right there. And the tempter came to him and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. So he was waiting till Jesus was the weakest. And so to me that says I have to be really careful when I'm hungry <laughs> or tired. Um, I heard a, an acronym, HALT, H-A-L-T, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. If you're any one of those, slow down, be careful not to sin, take extra precaution <laughs> because the temptation will be very strong. Um, and be slow to speak, slow to respond, and slow to act. Don't, and don't, don't try to make big decisions when we're not feeling, when we're not feeling, um, when our flesh is really down like that, just can wait for a little while. Don't try to respond when I'm in the middle of a feeling really angry. Bad, bad feel it, feelings aren't sin, but acting on them is. <laughs> and so I see what Satan really tries to use when our, our feelings are stirred up. So sometimes it's wise to wait for them to calm down <laughs> before acting and uh, deciding. And so um, that was another scheme. Number seven, Appealing to emotions over God's will. Uh, it's a mistake to judge what's right or wrong by saying it's good because this feels right. Or it's not good because it just doesn't feel, it feels wrong. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things. And it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so to see, I have to listen to God's word. Um, and my conscience and the Holy Spirit, not my feelings and emotions, that's different because they can be so deceptive. Um, and I, I think that's one of the greatest deceptions today is do what makes you happy. Um, in the name of happiness and freedom, uh, so much sin uh, being committed without thought of anybody else or consequences. And I once heard someone ask, um, in the world today, what movie would sell more tickets? The story of a woman who stays at home to care for her aging parents or the woman who follows her dreams. <laughs> um, it's becoming more and more justified to, to follow whatever makes us happy. And rather than doing what's right, or thinking of other people, or thinking of love um, and honoring God, but to, to give up what we want, our gain for the sake of others, that's real life, that's real joy. And um, I remember there's a time in the Bible where J Peter was appealing to Jesus' emotions, and I think Satan was doing it through Peter. Satan was using that appealing to Jesus' emotions when Jesus said, I got to go to the cross and die. And no, don't do it. I think Peter probably had some sympathy there. Don't do it. It's not, you don't deserve that. Like that type of attitude. I don't, he might not have said those words, but, um, and, but I was so blessed to see how hostile Jesus was with it. It's almost like his emotions didn't even exist because he knew what God's will was. Um, and it's not that God doesn't care for our emotions or every part of us, but he, he doesn't want us to be slaves to them, and he wants us to get the true joy, the true lasting, um, the, the, the true eternal riches that last, not the temporary satisfying of um, a feeling. And so I saw that Satan will appeal to our emotions and that we have to reject it harshly like Jesus did. Um, one, one other one is uh, a short one in Jude, in Jude 1. Verse 4, it says, Certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. This is verse 4. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. I, uh, I found out that the definition of licentiousness means a license to sin. It said, a wanton disregard or transgressions of laws. Basically, it's saying they turn the grace of God, the fact that God forgives and that we know God is loving, that means you can sin all you want. Um, it doesn't matter because you're going to heaven, you're saved, you're forgiven, so go ahead, sin. Um, and to see that 
some sometimes Satan can use that um, and to, to watch out for that and say, God saved me. That's why I don't want to sin. <laughs> Not God saved me so I can sin. <laughs> um, I know that when I do sin, I do have forgiveness. God's love, God loves me. But all the more it should mean I don't want to sin because of that. Um, and then the last one, number nine, the, the last scheme um, that I wanted to share that I've noticed in the past few years is if Satan can't get us to stop fighting sin, he'll try to get us to lose the joy in our life with God. Um, I think very few people fight sin. Maybe even many professed Christians don't fight that seriously against sin. And out of that number, even fewer people do it joyfully. <laughs> I think I've seen it, I could say that because I've seen it in my own life, how much I've spent. Yeah, I generally have a, a thought, I don't want to sin, but so much of my life with God I've spent without joy, um, not seeing God's will was for a higher level than that. And so to see that the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. So the, the fight against sin is also a fight not to lose the joy of the Lord because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if Satan can rob us, if he can't get us to blatantly sin, maybe he'll try to start removing the joy so that we won't have any strength to fight sin. Um, so may the Lord help us to be in that very, very few number who not just run the race seriously, but also joyfully. <laughs> so, um, we can, yeah, we can keep that, that joy and the, the hope and confidence in God that we can overcome. There's no condemnation for our past um, sins if we really repented. And um, yeah, our memory verse, I think, is um, an encouraging one in this regard. Matthew 24, 13, the one that endures to the end will be saved. And so God will help us overcome. We've all failed, but we have to press on. And, and in relation to this, um, we actually wanted to share a short video that's... Um, Along with this, we need an encouragement that God is so easy on us. He doesn't remember our sins. If we're genuine, if we're sincere, that we don't have to be down for failure and we, um, we can press on with uh, confidence. And so we wanted to share the, the CFC Day devotion that Brother Zach spoke, um, and it was from a couple days ago. So we're going to just uh, play that right now, um, if we can get it up. Do you believe that denying Jesus three times is worse than adultery? I believe that. It's worse than committing adultery three times. To deny Jesus and say, I don't know him, it's blasphemy. And blasphemy is worse than adultery. And yet, Jesus never prayed that Peter should not fall. He said, Peter, before the cock crows twice, you're going to deny me three times and I'm not going to pray that you should not fall. Why is that? God's ways are not our ways. Turn to Luke 22, verse 34. I say to you, Peter, Luke 22, 34. I say to you, Peter, before the cock crows today, you'll deny me three times. You'll commit the terrible sin of denying Jesus Christ. But I'm not going to pray that you won't fall. You will do it. But I'm praying something else for you. Verse 32. What I'm praying for you is that after you fall three times, your faith will not fail. That when you have hit rock bottom and you realize you're a hopeless good for nothing person, you've reached a zero point in your life, I pray that you won't give up there. That right there, hitting rock bottom, you'll say, but my father still loves me. Like the prodigal son, I'll get up and go back to him. That's the faith that would not fail. A faith not to fail is to believe that God loves me even when I've failed miserably. Is there somebody here like that? You've tried and tried and tried so long and your whole life has been just a, a secret experience of failure that you're never able to share with anybody else. You look around in a church that preaches victory and you hear about victory on Sundays and Sunday after Sunday you hear the powerful messages and you sit there and say, boy, this is for everybody else. It's not for me. 
I'm not like the others in this church. I'm just defeated, but this is a good church to belong to. I want to be here. But I better not let anybody know that I'm just thoroughly defeated. Thoroughly, thoroughly defeated. You feel like that? Well, this message is for you. The Lord says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you who are a total failure. That your faith will not fail. Never mind how many times you fell into whatever sin. That your faith that God will still lift me up. That God still loves me. Don't lose that faith. Even if you have denied the Lord three times or fallen into some sin again and again and again. Maybe you have sincerely tried. But you have failed. I want to tell you in Jesus name. That God still loves you. And he's praying that your faith will not fail. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Why did he want Peter to fail? I'll tell you. Because the guy was so proud. He said, even if everybody denies you, not me. Such people have to fail. You know, God tries to break us in many ways. He tries to break us through financial difficulties. He tries to break us through sicknesses. He tries to break us through difficult bosses, through difficult people, difficult neighbors, difficult relatives, and through fathers-in-law and mothers-in-law. You know, he broke Moses through a father-in-law. He broke Jacob through another father-in-law. Living with in-laws can be a tremendous way of being broken. And God did that with Jacob and with Moses. And, but when, he, when all these ways don't succeed, none of these ways are sinful. You know, financial difficulty, there's no sin in that. Sickness, there's no sin in that. Being irritated or troubled by a father-in-law or mother-in-law, there's no sin in that. But when all these ways to try and break you have failed, you're still the strong person. God says, then there's only one way to break you. You've got to fall into sin. It's not God's will. It's never God's will that we should fall into sin. But that's his last method. When every other method has failed to break strong people, he allows them to fall into sin. And he will not pray that you should not fall. That's what happened to Peter. Okay, Peter, you've got to fall. It's a... I've tried every other method with you. It hasn't succeeded. You got to fall. And he fell. Then he was broken. He wept bitterly. And that's why he went back to fishing. He said, no, not possible that I'll ever be an apostle again. Finished. I'm going back to my old trade. And that's when Jesus came and commissioned him again and said, Peter, do you love me? Peter's not the old Peter anymore. He doesn't say, if everybody doesn't love you, I love you. No, he says, Lord, I don't even know. I don't even know whether I love you. I can't say anything. I want to love you. Peter, feed my sheep. I'm commissioning you again. You're not to be a fisherman. You're to be an apostle. He was broken. He had come to a zero point. God filled him with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. That failure was his preparation for Pentecost. Many people don't realize. I know in my life it was exactly the same. Total failure was the preparation for Pentecost in my life. If I had only known that, I was discouraged. Most of the time discouraged because nothing seemed to be working. But God had a be beautiful future for me and he has for you too. I want to tell you in Jesus' name. And on the day of Pentecost when God used Peter so mightily that 3,000 people were Jews, were converted, baptized in water and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I can imagine one of the apostles coming up and slapping Peter on the back and saying, Hey Peter, that was great man. Your 15 minute sermon brought 3,000 Jews to Christ. I mean, bringing one Jew to Christ itself should excite anybody. 
bringing 3,000 Jews to Christ and they take baptism and are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Wow! What a man of God you are! <laughs> Peter said, I don't believe all that. I know what I did six weeks ago. <laughs> I know what I did six weeks ago. I denied my Lord three times. I'm a hopeless person. But Jesus has done something for me and I can never glory in it. If the Lord did something today through me, it's not going to go to my head anymore. It would really have gone to Peter's head. 3,000 Jews getting converted, baptized. And imagine if it happened to you, brother. You went and preached a brief sermon somewhere and 3,000 Jews got converted and baptized in, baptized in the Holy Spirit. You wouldn't be able to keep your head the same size after that. What was it that saved Peter? God had brought him to a zero point before that. And before God can use anybody mightily to accomplish wonderful things for him, he has to bring us to a zero point and then fill us with the Holy Spirit. That is God's way. So don't get discouraged. Say, Lord, bring me to that zero point quickly. Bring me to the place where I know I cannot make it so that you lead me into this promised land where I don't trust in my own strength anymore. I trust you to give me victory. Let's pray. There is hope for everyone. While there is life, there is hope. So don't ever get discouraged. You are on your way there. Every failure is one step closer to that zero point. Say, Lord, I am determined to go all the way with you. I don't care how long it takes. I am going to get there. I'm going to enter the promised land. I'm going to enter into this spirit-filled life where Jesus keeps me from falling day by day and it will never go to my head. Where Jesus will make rivers of living water flow through me and it won't go to my head, not even secretly. Heavenly Father, help us each one. You know, your purposes for us are beyond our understanding, but they're always for our good. Thank you for your ways that are perfect. In Jesus' name, Amen.